Hello, I'm Christina Raab, Vice President of Strategy for the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute. Nancy Gillis, CEO of the Global Electronics Council, joins us today for our next 5 in 10 conversation. The Global Electronics Council is a mission-driven nonprofit that seeks to achieve a world of only sustainable technology. The Council manages EBIT, the leading global eco-label for technology products and services. Prior, Nancy served as global lead for resilient and responsible supply chains at Ernst & Young. She also was director of the Federal Supply Chain Office at the U.S. General Services Administration during the Obama administration. Earlier this year, Nancy joined the Stakeholder Advisory Council of the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute. Nancy, thank you for being our guest today. Great, and thank you for this invitation for what I'm sure to be an interesting conversation in a short amount of time. I'm excited. I have no doubt about it. I'm also very excited. And Nancy, um, let us uh, look at the current situation. So electronics represent the fastest growing waste stream in the world today. Can you help to clarify what is at stake here in terms of the scope of the problem as well as the opportunity it represents? It's a very good question. And you are right. Uh, E-waste is the glowing waste stream um, for the world it has been exacerbated by the horrible pandemic that we have been in because we've seen an increase in individuals and organizations buying even more electronics to continue to engage. So we've got a lot of electronics being made, being bought, um, and not a good way to dispose of them. And what do I mean by most electronics. Well, across the board, approximately 80% of the electronics that we use in our lives don't get recycled. Instead, they end up in a waste stream somewhere, um, and in particular in landfills. And so what's the problem? Well, it's a big social one, right? There are a lot of communities who are suffering health impairments, problems, because they happen to be located to one of these landfills, right? You've also have an economic problem. So a lot of these technologies, the computers we're using to talk on have, as you know, a lot of valuable materials and minerals within them that we're not pooling out. So not only are we creating a health hazard for communities by having this waste stream grow and landfills grow across the world, we're also leaving a lot of economic benefit behind. And a lot of these actual electronics work because of particular type of materials. And some of those rare and critical minerals are ones that aren't necessarily available everywhere. And so if they happen to be in a country that decides to actually not share them, then that means we don't have the necessary components to put these electronics together. So when you talk about e-waste, some people don't think about all of the ramifications of having our electronics predominantly go to waste instead of going back circular into uh, use, what those ramifications are. They're bad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And speaking about the circle economy, what are the, let's say, three most mission critical challenges that need to be solved to arrive at a circularity for electronics? That's a good question. And that's actually where the areas of opportunity that you asked about are as well. So if we've got most everything going to a waste, non-sustainable waste, it's sitting somewhere in a landfill, what can we do about it? Well, first and foremost, we can stop it from going immediately to a waste stream, right? So we can start designing these products. So it's a design opportunity to be able to be used longer. And that means not only that they themselves on first life are used longer, but it also means really designing them for repair and refurbishment. Now that means that you also have then the challenge of, can you actually repair and refurbish products at scale? So all products globally. So that means companies need to start modifying their supply chains. They need to start creating a chain that includes enough access to quality refurbished components. They also need to build a supply chain with refurbishers and repairers. 
right? If you expect to refurbish and repair your product, where do you go? Are there enough of those opportunities available? And that leads to another opportunity of job creation. Do we have refurbishers? Do we have repairers who are able to repair all of the many electronics that we use in our daily life? So going to circularity, just the first portion of that, which means keeping the products out of the landfills for as long as possible, design, refurbish, repair, opportunities and challenges in all that area. And you mentioned supply chains. Uh, during your tenure as director of the U.S. Federal Supply Chain Office under President Obama, you demonstrated the power of specifying sustainability criteria as part of purchasing strategies. And where and how can the global procurement community leverage its, its influence to accelerate a circle economy for electronics? Well, it goes to the prior question. They can start asking for products that were designed for life elongation, for staying in the market as long as possible. So products that can be repaired, products that can be refurbished. But it's also a major business model shift. We used to buy things for those things. We bought the hardware. What happens if we don't buy them anymore? What happens if we lease them? What happens if we rent them? The business model then becomes one in which those who put the products in the market, instead of making their money by having us buy new products faster and faster and faster, they start making their money by building and designing those products that stay in the market. So what purchasers can do now is actually change their type of procurement. Instead of focusing on hardware, focus on the utility of the product. And that utility of the product should be It's one that can stay in the market longer because it can be repaired and it can be refurbished. And then once you have it in the, pro in the market for as long as you can, it of course is going to go to a point in time where it's no longer going to do what it's going to do. Because I'm not saying that manufacturers should make products that exist forever because that's unrealistic and I understand that. But then what can purchasers do? They can also ask about, well, If this product finally has to be disposed of, how well can this product have the parts of it go back into a production stream? So right now, you do have a lot of great electronics that are out there that can be recycled, but not recycled where as much of it can go back and somebody use the material flows not just the pieces, but breaking it down actually into the plastic and the iron, the stuff that makes it up, that goes to the heart of it. So a purchaser not only can start looking at, I don't need to buy the product, I can lease it. If I lease it, is it as possible as it can be to repair and refurbish it? They can also say, if I'm getting these products through leasing, when it's finally end of life, have you designed it to when you break it apart, Will it go back into material flow? That is what the power of purchaser can do. And actually, that's what purchasers, large scale purchasers, governments are starting to do now. Mm -hmm. uh, sounds very promising. And uh, what role do certifications and standards like an EPEED uh, or the Cradle to Cradle certified product standard play in all of this? It makes it easy. <laughs> What we do makes it easy. And how does it make it easy? It doesn't mean that maintaining um, an eco-label uh, such as Cradle, Cradle or EPEAT is easy, because as we know, it's not. Um, because what those eco-labels have to do is they have to be life cycle, right? They have to address impacts at all the phases of the product. And they increasingly now have to think about that product not just being sustainable, but actually being circular. So being able to go back into material flows. We talked about the repair and refurbishment and so forth. So they really have to address that. And the easy part is when that eco label addresses it, it means that all a purchaser has to do is ask for the eco label. The purchaser then doesn't have to think about all of those things on their own, they just need to know, oh, there's the eco-label, it's a trusted eco-label and I can use it. And so as the products are more complex, as what does it mean to be credibly circular becomes more complex, 
what we need to do is make it more easy on the purchasers and eco labels do exactly that. Nancy, uh, let us look into the future. Let us consider what tomorrow uh, looks like. What will we gain in a world powered by sustainable circular electronics? Well, you know, part of the challenge that we're facing right now is what is the negative impact of non-circular products, right? They're landfills, right? They are plastics in our oceans. They're, they're waste that is everywhere. And that is having both an environmental but a health impact on us and our children. So what does a circular world look like? It's one in which we stop those health impacts, right? Because we are no longer creating the waste. And we're no longer having to dig into the earth to get some of the materials and minerals we need. We are no longer having to unsustainably use our natural resources, which means there's more resources for us to enjoy. So we're healthier, we're mentally happier, but we're also leaving the forests and the necessary defenses for climate change. So circularity will leave a world that is better prepared to address the impacts that we're feeling on climate change. It's also a world of new jobs that make sense, a world in where there's jobs in which you're actually learning how to take those products we recaptured and recycle or repair, or refurbish them in a way that puts them back into the material flows. So it's a world of new technologies that's helping existing technologies. And it's a world of education that really looks at how technologies need to work differently. So it's design jobs, which are really cool. Um, and then I would say that lastly, that new world is one in which we're able to really appreciate the technology, um, but not fear that it's coming at the cost of people or planet. Because that's the thing, right? Many of us have made it so far through COVID because we have this technology, because I can speak to you today. Um, so we need it but it can't be because of the negative costs that we're experiencing. So that's the future world. <laughs> well, thank you, Nancy, uh, for being uh, with us today and for sharing your valuable insights as part of the 5 in 10 interview series. Thank you for the opportunity again.